we are moving forward in our series, Victorious. This is our third week of this series. This is a four-week series. And in this series, we're talking about the power and the importance of the cross. We're talking about the victory of the cross that has been made possible in Jesus Christ. And last week, our focus was living the cross. The week before, our focus was just getting into the beginnings of this conversation that the, of the victory that has been made possible in the cross. And this week, we're going to just continue to expand on that conversation. And next week at Easter, we're going to wrap it up as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And for today's message, I want to do something a little different. We don't do this every week. This is something that we've really never done before. I want to invite you in just a moment, you don't have to do it quite yet, to close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, I am going to read some scripture John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is a passage from a conversation that Jesus is having with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. And even if you're brand new to church, when I read John 3, 16 specifically, you'll probably think, oh, I've heard that somewhere before. It's a very famous passage of scripture. And sometimes when we come to something familiar, we think, oh, I've heard that before. But I want us to kind of break those walls down today. And as your eyes are closed, I'm actually going to read John 3, 16, and 17 from three different translations of Scripture. And I want you to just allow these words to speak to you by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within your heart and mind. And so what I'll do is I'll read from one translation. I'll pause for a moment. Read from another translation. Pause for a moment. Then read from the third translation and then invite you to open your eyes. But my hope is that from reading from these different translations, that possibly a word or a phrase will connect with you in a different way. And the Spirit of God will speak to you because this passage, John 3, 16 and 17, is central to the victory of the cross that has been made possible in Jesus. So I know this is new. I know we haven't done this before. But I actually believe that this can be an exercise where God will really speak to our hearts this morning. So please close your eyes for just a moment. Get your hearts and minds focused on Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This you see is how much God loved the world, enough to give his only special son, so that everyone who believes in him should not be lost, but should share in the life of God's new age. After all, God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world could be saved by him. For this is the way that God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Jesus, we thank you that out of love you gave your life and that it is through you we can experience victory in what it means to be conquerors in you, Christ. I pray that we would experience the reality of being saved and rescued by you. And as we focus on this reality of the cross today, may we not become numb to this. May this not just be something that, oh, I've heard that before. But may your spirit speak to us in a unique way and set our hearts and minds on fire And may we hear from you, Lord. In your name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you for doing that with me. I'm not sure what came to your mind when 
you were hearing that scripture, or maybe even you had a difficult time staying focused. We live in such a distracted world, it's hard to focus in moments like that. But it's so important for us to consider these words of Jesus and what exactly it is that the cross accomplishes. In fact, that text right there takes us back to our main idea for this series, which is this. The cross of Jesus solidifies the victory of God over Satan, evil, and death. The cross of Jesus solidifies the victory of God over Satan, evil, and death. The way in which God brings about his victory in the world and the way in which God will bring about the full renewal and restoration of his creation is through the work of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. And so what I want to do is make a couple of observations about this very idea that come directly from John 3, 16, and 17. And for those of you who have been following along in this series, you might for a moment think, Scott, we're getting a little redundant here. Don't worry, we're going somewhere, and there's something really important for us to take from this. So the first concept is this, God loves and God gives. If you're taking notes, write that down. God loves and God gives. We see that in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We see this further revealed in scripture that God gave his son and the son gives of himself. He gives his life. God is a generous God and it is an act of love by which he gives. God loves and God gives. We looked at this passage last week, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. By this, the love of God is revealed in us, that God has sent his one and only son into the world so that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent or gave his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God loves and God gives. God loves the world that he, so much that he gave his son. Is there a little bit of a clicking coming through my mic? I thought I heard something. We're good? Perfect. I just get distracted sometimes. John 13, 34. Jesus says this. I give you a new commandment. To love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So this love that we experience from God as a result of the Son loving and giving of himself is now a reality that we now embrace and we are to embody and we are to live in. So not only are we loved by God, but then we are to be representatives of that love. We are to embody that love. We are to live out that love. So the love that we experience from God is not just for me to hold on to for me. You are not just saved for the sake of yourself, you're saved for the sake of others as well. We are to love in community. Secondly, we see God gives. Jesus says this very clearly in John chapter 10. He says, this is why the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life. Your translation might say, because I give my life. I lay down my life so that I may take it back again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down on my own free will. Notice Jesus says, hey, nobody can take it from me, but I give my life. Jesus is generous. Jesus gave his life. And that's who we are to model our lives after. Think about that. What does it mean for us to be so filled with love and transformed by the love of Jesus that we give of ourselves, that we give of our resources, that we give of what has been given to us because everything we have has been given to us from him. The Apostle Paul phrased it this way in Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to all of this? If God is for us, who is against us? God, after all, did not spare his own son. He did what? He gave him up for us all. God loves and God gives. Galatians 1, 3 through 4, Paul says it this way. Grace and peace to you from the God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. 
I know I keep saying this over and over again, but I'm saying it over and over again because it's really, really, really important. God loves and God gives. God loves and God gives. Therefore, we are to be people who love and give. But Galatians 1 takes us to our next idea. God rescues. God rescues. Do you know if you have come to know Jesus, you are a part of God's rescue mission. Not only have you been rescued by him, but he commissions you to go be a part of rescuing others. You are on God's rescue mission. You have been rescued by him. We have been rescued to be on the rescue mission. But this brings up an interesting question. Who or what have we been rescued from? Who or what have we been rescued from? Mark chapter 10, Jesus is in an interesting conversation with two of his followers, James and John. And it starts off like this in Mark 10, verses 35 through 36. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? A couple of things here. First of all, because we find out that they said this publicly in front of the other disciples, in front of their other friends. Could you imagine going up to the leader you've been following and just saying, hey, you, yeah, you, uh, I want you to do whatever, whatever, whatever we ask. Whatever I want, I want you to do that for me. Could you imagine saying that to Jesus? Now, Jesus does tell us to ask, so I kind of get where they're coming from, but they say this in front of everybody. Hey, we want you to do whatever. And then consider the gracious response of Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Isn't that kind of crazy that that's how Jesus responds to them? What do you want me to do for you? And their answer is so revealing as to the disposition of their own heart, but it's also revealing because we have to ask ourselves, how would we respond if Jesus said that to us? How would you respond right now if Jesus said to you, what do you want me to do for you? What's the first thing that comes to your heart or mind? Is it something that's selfless or selfish? Just think about it. Where are you at with that? Look at their response. Permit one of us to sit at your right hand and the other at the left in your glory. The other followers, they start getting upset at this point. A lot of people believe they start getting upset because they weren't the ones to ask before them. So there's like a competition going on. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're the ones who want status. We're the ones who want to be noticed. We're the ones who want to sit at your right and left. And and, whoa, how, how could you? This is what they ask for. This is the kingdom of the ruler of this world at work within them. This is what the ruler of this world wants us to think, that we deserve to be noticed, that we should have status, that we should be in this place of glory. They didn't want to be followers of the king. They wanted to be kings themselves. And we have to ask ourselves, is this how we would respond? I know there are moments that I have to check my own heart. Is this about me getting attention or is this about Jesus? Is this about putting the attention on him? Is this about being like Jesus? And we start to see here, this is what Jesus came to rescue us from. Jesus came to rescue us from this idea and this mentality that we should be noticed all of the time, that we deserve deserve the accolades, that we should be the ones who should be praised and worshiped and followed. Jesus came to rescue us from this idolatry of other things, but also this idolatry of self. Because that will ultimately lead to destruction and despair. And Jesus says this to them in Mark 10, 45. He says, this is the, he basically says, this is the essence of my kingdom work. He said, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. So if you're looking for title, status, and you're not looking to serve, you don't have the essence of the kingdom. When I'm looking for title or status, I'm not in the essence of the kingdom. The essence of the kingdom is not to be served, but to serve. And he says, and it is to give his life as a ransom for many. So the heart of the kingdom is to be one who serves, and in being one who serves, you're a part of God's rescue mission, but God has rescued us from the one who's holding a ransom over us. Jesus here mentions ransom. 
And this is where we start to get back to the question I initially started with on this point. Who did Jesus come or what did Jesus come to rescue us from? And what the scriptures reveal is that the enemy, the ruler of this world, was holding a ransom note over humanity and saying, they belong to me. That's the reign of the ruler. That's the reign of death. And Jesus, in giving his life in our place, outsmarts the enemy by the power of love and through the power of his death, burial, and resurrection. Because the enemy was blinded by love, he couldn't really see or understand what was happening. If he would have known what he was doing by putting Jesus to death, he wouldn't have done it. But he doesn't understand love. He doesn't understand generosity. And so Jesus came to save us, and he outsmarted the enemy on the cross. That's how the Apostle Paul phrases this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, instead we speak the wisdom of God hidden in a mystery that God determined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it. They didn't understand it. If they had known it, if they would have understood it, if they would have seen what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written... Things that no eye has seen or ear heard or mind imagined are the things God has prepared for those who love him. Those who love him. It is through love and loving, generous sacrifice that Jesus has come to rescue us, to reconcile us to God and rescue us from the reign of the ruler of this world. I know a great illustration for this. It comes from the Narnia series. I could mention it, but I'm not going to. But I could, because I know that I reference the line, the witch in the wardrobe all the time, and some of you are sick of it. So instead, I'm going to mention another book series, Harry Potter. <laughs> some of you are like, whoa, in church? Yes. <laughs> in Harry Potter, Harry's mother gives her life in place of Harry to rescue him from Voldemort's curse. And Dumbledore explains it this way later on to Harry. Check this out. Your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. Think of Satan in that way. There's one thing Satan cannot understand. It is love. He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. Remember, Harry had the mark, if you know the story. But there's another mark, a more powerful mark. Not a scar, not a visible sign. See, there's a mark that's more powerful than the scars that Jesus bared on the cross. Not a scar, no visible sign. To have been loved so deeply even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. Now, obviously, there's some ways in which this analogy falls short, but this is at the essence and the heart of what happened in the gospel. The enemy could not understand what was happening. He thought that he had won the day and would have permanent rule over the earth and over humanity by Jesus giving his life. He did not understand the power of love, the power of the Spirit of God at work within Jesus to bring him to resurrection. And so what happens is, is now those who follow Jesus no longer have to be under the reign of the ruler of this world, but they can now be under the reign of life in Christ because God gives, God loves, and God rescues. And he's rescued you. He's rescued me. He's rescued us if we are followers of Jesus. There's a new way to live and a different way to be human. We don't have to submit to the ways of the ruler of this world. Now, I want to further illustrate this for you. And for that to happen, I need to bring some volunteers on stage because there's some things I'd like to bring some clarity to. So if Tony and Hutton and Demarcus and Steve could come on stage that would be amazing. I already asked them beforehand if they would volunteer. Where's Steve at? Is Steve in here anyway? Steve, come on. Where is he? I don't see him. Oh, he's backstage. Wow, everyone give Steve a hand. What an entrance. What an entrance, Steve. Now, these, you guys don't have to say anything. You, you guys, I'm just going to move you around. But can we give our volunteers a hand for coming on stage? We can clap for them later, too. 
Okay, oh, I forgot. I have some stuff for you guys as well. So you guys are all playing different parts as we illustrate this. Sorry to the camera people. Uh, okay, so here we go. Tony, I'm going to give you a Bible because you're Jesus, the very word of God, okay? The word made flesh. And DeMarcus, I, this is going to be the most elaborate one to get on. I went and got this from my friend, Pastor Charles McCarley at Tabernacle of Praise. You are going to represent and play God. So if you could just put that robe on, uh, it might take a minute. I don't know. Steve, I'm sorry to do this to you, but you're playing Satan in the story. I got that for you. I know, good medieval Satan there, because we all know he has a pitchfork or whatever. Uh, there are, do you want to wear these? Do you want to wear these? And then, uh, I don't know, we don't need that. <laughs> we don't need that either. No, uh, too many props came with the Satan outfit. Uh, okay, it was just on Amazon. Oh, you don't need the hanger, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. You're good, but I guess we could use it for something, but we're good. Dude, you got white shoes with the robe, so it looks perfect. You're a great... Okay, DeMarcus, who is God, can you come stand right here and just stand like this? Perfect, perfect. This is God. And then can you like stand with your arms folded like this? And don't look super happy. We're going to have you look happy later, but don't look super happy right now, okay? And then Hutton, can you come stand right here and just look at God? Perfect, thank you. He's not actually God. We're not heretical here, but you're just, you're playing God. Yeah, you could be Morgan Freeman. That's true, Bruce Almighty. I'm down for that. Okay, so sometimes, excuse me, sometimes the way we talk about the cross, this is almost the disposition or, or, the, or the picture that we have, that God is upset and frustrated and angry towards humanity. And then all of a sudden, come on over here, Jesus, Jesus was with God. You can stand next to God for a moment. We have this whole thing called the Trinity. I don't have time to get into it this morning, but we believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he's all three at one, and, but he can be three. It, it's, just, it's a lot going on. Maybe you can teach on the Trinity one Sunday. <laughs> you can do it. Okay, perfect. So you're going to play Jesus. We can talk about the cross sometimes, and I think this is unintentional, but this is, this is what it sounds like. So God's upset. He's angry at humanity. You're all of humanity. You represent everybody. You, you, yeah, you're doing a great job. And all of humanity, all of creation, he's upset. And all of a sudden, Jesus, can you stand here just like this? Jesus just gets in. You're playing Jesus, Tony. And the story that we tell is God's upset, God's frustrated, God's angry. Oh, but thankfully, Jesus had an idea. And he said, hey, I, I really love these humans. And we know you love Hutton because she's your wife. So, But, but the, the story we tell is like, Jesus is like, I love these humans. They're great people. And it's kind of like, hey, Dad, um, can, can you just be a little kinder to them? Because I love them, so I'm going to step in place for them. That's kind of the story that we tell sometimes. And it seems like God is just frustrated. Jesus is the loving, friendly, kind one. He gets in way, the way of God. And then, you know, you guys are good, but you're always kind of wondering, like, am I good with God? What's going on here? But what we miss in, when we tell the story that way is that God and the Son are one. That's what Jesus says. And then when we tell the story this way, Satan is like off over here, and you're like, what really is his role? What is he really doing in the midst of all of this? What's the purpose? Also in telling the story this way, it feels almost like it's God versus Jesus to get to humans, or God against humans and Jesus steps in the way. And, and where this idea comes from or this thought, I don't know if it definitely comes from this, but it comes from kind of this idea that, I'm sorry, I'm preaching, you're in the middle, I'm sorry, I, don't, I hope I don't spit on anybody, uh, hopefully we're okay. It, one of the things we say, and I'm about to say something that if you've been in church a long time, it might sound a little obscure, it might sound a little strange, just give me some grace, I'm going to roll it back and explain it. Are we good? Okay. So one of the things that we say, we say it in our songs, we say it in conversations, we say... God poured his wrath out on Jesus. Now, this is one of my Bibles. I have a lot of them at home. This is going to sound a little obscure, a little strange, a little different. Do you know there is not one verse in all of the Old Testament or New Testament, and I can say this confidently, any translation, there is not one verse that says God poured his wrath out on Jesus. Not one. Here's why this is important. 
we don't need to develop this idea that God is just angry at Jesus for no good reason, and so he just gets angry at Jesus and upset with Jesus. So he's just mad at Jesus, and he's mad, and so he's just angry, and so he has to, he has to pour out all this frustration. I would have you do like a fake punch or something, but we don't need to go that far. So he just pours out all this frustration. Yeah, getting him. So he's just so angry. He's got to do this, and it feels like in this scenario that Jesus is rescuing us from God. So now, some of you might be thinking, okay, Scott, but a lot of people who are faithful followers of Jesus, who talk, talk about God's wrath being poured out on Jesus. So where does that idea come from? And that's a really good question. And it's a, a meaningful question. The idea comes from Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. In Matthew chapter 26, 39, Jesus is praying before he faces the cross. And he prays this. Going a little farther, he threw himself down with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if possible... Let this cup pass from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus says, may this cup pass from me. Many scholars and theologians throughout history have said that that cup that Jesus talks about is in reference to God's wrath that is talked about in the book of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Psalms, and other Old Testament passages. So Jesus is talking about, if it's possible, may I be spared of the wrath of God. And so the thought is that the wrath of God is then expressed on the cross towards Jesus. Which brings us to another question. Okay, if that's what that is, we have to then ask, how is the wrath of God revealed? And how is the wrath of God expressed? Is the wrath of God, God just getting really angry and upset and frustrated at the Son on the cross? And I would suggest to you that when we look at the scriptures, we do see something called the wrath of God on the cross, but it's expressed in a way that's maybe differently than what we would previously thought about it. We're going to bring you over in just a moment, Satan. You're doing good over there, Stan, and thank you so much. The Apostle Paul actually talks about how the wrath of God is applied or expressed in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says this is in Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. So Paul says that God's wrath is revealed against those who are walking in sin, who've given their lives to unrighteousness. And then he goes on in chapter 1 to reveal how God's wrath is revealed. I know I have you guys up here a long time. You're doing great. Thank you so much. I had to do some preaching in between this skit, but you're doing great. Paul explains how God's wrath is revealed. So he says there's God's wrath that is revealed against those who are wrapped up in sin, who've given themselves fully to sin. But then he says how it's applied, what it looks like. He says this in Romans 1, 24 through 26. Therefore, God gave them over in the desire of their hearts to impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. He says this a second time. For this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. Twice, in Paul revealing how God's wrath is expressed, he says God gave them over over. And then he says it a third time in Romans 1, 28 through 31. This will be up on the screen for you as well. Check this out. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what should not be done. They are filled with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, malice. They are rife with envy, murder, strife, deceit, hostility. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, contrivers of all sorts of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless covenant breakers, heartless and ruthless. Not good people. A lot going on. Paul reveals here that God's wrath is essentially divine withdrawal. It is when the Father, Jesus, the Spirit have done all they can do in a person's life and then grace and mercy become counterproductive because those people have so given themselves over to sin that, the God, that God's wrath is actually the removal of God's presence. Now some of you might be thinking, well, no, 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 I need, I need an angry God, I need an angry God. Okay, 
First of all, I would ask, why? Why do you need God to be so angry and upset? Who are you so angry and upset with? We are taught to love our enemies. But why? And then secondly, if there is a situation where God has removed his presence, that sounds like wrath to me. Because can you imagine anything worse than a reality where there is no hope, no life, no light, nothing but destruction? I can't think of anything worse than that. If God's presence is not there, God removes his presence to those who have so given themselves over to sin in hopes that potentially by hitting the very bottom, they might eventually recognize, recognize their need for God. The wrath of God is divine withdrawal. So how do we see this expressed on the cross then? All right, son, can we go back with the Father for just a moment? Jesus, enter Satan. Enter Satan. Now, Satan, can you just look at humanity like this? So you're kind of over humanity, over, over humanity and all the world, the ruler of this world. That's a scary thought. For... <laughs> he said the apple was pretty good, wasn't it? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so what happens on the cross is the father let's do this we're going to have big loving arms open with a big smile on our face if you can't keep your arms up the whole time I get it but you're a strong dude you got this let's keep them open this is the father's disposition towards humanity and to the world love, giving, and generosity but humanity has been enslaved by the ruler of this world, Satan. So what the father does, sorry, you're a good guy, Steve. What the father does is out of love, he gives the son. So the son comes over here. You can stand in front of the humanity in the world here. Gives his life in place of humanity. The enemy thinks he has won the day. And the son becomes his very antithesis. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. Jesus became sin itself on the cross. And so what happens, and according to Romans 1, when humans or someone become sin? What happens? God withdraws. He removes his presence. He removes for a moment. Then we see in the story that the darkness came over the land. And this is why we see this, Matthew chapter 27, why the son screams out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the father withdraws, the son gives his life in humanity's place. The enemy thinks he has won. He thinks he is victorious. But sorry, you're not. In fact, what happens is through the power of resurrection, can you turn this way? Yes, hold the Bible in one hand, hold your hand out in another, hold your hand out, this hand out. Those who now believe in the Son, we can hold hands. Are you guys good holding hands? I mean, you're married, so you're good. We've never held hands, ever. Oh, my goodness. I don't do marriage counseling. So <laughs> I, what happens is, is then the Son, through the power of resurrection, Father, we can turn back around. The Son then can carry those through the victory of the cross to a new reign, a new domain. He is defeated. So what this means is those who now are in the Son and follow the Son and have given their life to the Son can now live in the power of victory in this life and in the life to come. So yes, there is a future hope and resurrection and restoration of all of creation that will happen in eternity, but this new life as kingdom citizens begins right here, right now, which means that humanity that is in Christ is now walking around in the world in enemy-occupied territory and bringing about a kingdom message and kingdom life and kingdom hope, and you are now empowered by the son being and empowered by Tony, you know, with you is you are now empowered to bring the message of life, hope, and light through the power of the Holy Spirit all throughout the world in enemy-occupied territory, and you are now the Son giving this message of love and generosity and rescue to humanity to carry, human to carry out the role and the domain of the kingdom in the world that is enemy-occupied territory. We then join God on his rescue mission. Thank you. That's why... 
Colossians 2, turn back around. You've been defeated. Colossians 2, 14 and 15 says this. He has destroyed what was against us, a certificate of indebtedness expressed in decrees opposed to us. He has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. What did he do? He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public disgrace of them, triumphing over them by the power of the cross. Hebrews chapter 2, the author of Hebrews says it this way. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise shared in their humanity so that through death he could destroy the one. You destroyed him. You took him out. You could destroy the one who holds the power of death. You no longer, you will die in this world, but you'll experience life to come, eternal life. That is the devil. Sorry, I don't mean to be, <laughs> just for illustration. I don't feel like I should be a worship leader. Uh, he, he wants to sit down from the worship team. No, you're a great worship leader, honoring Jesus. Thank you. And set free. You've been set free. Those who were in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. And 1 John 3, 8, John says this. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed to do what? To destroy the works of the devil. Reconciliation. And then you make Humanity ministers of reconciliation and enemy-occupied territory as ambassadors of Christ. We have been rescued. And it's a message of love. It's a message of hope. It's a message of truth and life that the Father loves the world. The message is not, the message is not for God so hated the world that he killed his only son. That's not the message. The message is God loved the world so much. That he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And Jesus says in John 17 that eternal life is that they know me. So that eternal life begins now and exists in the future resurrection and the age to come. Amen? Amen. 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 Can you guys give them a hand? Thank you all so much for joining us up here. Thank you for playing your parts. Thank you so much. Here, you can take this if you want. Thank you so much. Put <laughs> Enjoy it. Can I have that Bible actually? I'll need that for a moment. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Give them a hand again. They were incredible. That's the power of the cross. So I'd like to end this message with where we started. John 3, 16 and 17. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He came to rescue, save, redeem, and forgive. And it is from that we become rescued, saved, and redeemed, and forgiven people. So as God has loved, given, and rescued us, may we become people who love, give, and are a part of his rescue mission for others. Let's pray together.